Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Granger Smith, and welcome to a Smith Pump Company webinar. I'm really happy to uh, have a specific energy here today with us, and uh, I hope you get something out of this. Uh, it's uh, We've done this once before, and it was a very good presentation. Um, specific energy is a product that we represent that helps operators operate equipment properly. And uh, we're gonna tell you about what it does and how it does it. Um, I've got a few uh, kind of housekeeping things I wanted to tell you was, number one, I think everybody's muted uh, except the speakers. So if you have questions, you can type them into the Q&A feature. I think you can get to those at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will answer those either as we go through this presentation or at the end in the Q&A. And there are a few minutes left for Q&A at the end. The other thing that I'd like to announce is there is a hydraulic training video that uh, we're going to send you a link to. Uh, we're going to get into some pretty deep uh, things from a hydraulic standpoint on how pumps operate. And um, this hydraulic training video should help with some of that if, if it's been a while since you've dealt with this. And so with that, um, I'd point out that um, we will send this out for PDH credits, so you'll have something to put in your files. Um, you know, basically, we're going to talk primarily about specific energies, dynamic pump optimizer. I think we'll go through a, a case study um, and uh, Mike Bernard with Specific Energy will make this presentation. But I think the first thing we've got is a poll. Uh, well, there's Mike, good picture of Mike. And, um, and then I think we go to the next slide and we've got a poll. So you'll be able to uh, type in uh, your answer on this poll and we'll give it just a minute to get everybody's input and then we'll announce the results. <laughs> So what is your greatest challenge associated with pump operation? Energy expenditure costs, operational failure, maintenance and repair, plugging and or fouling. We'll give you just a few more seconds to put your answer in and submit. Okay, Ian, what, what'd you get? Well, it looks like uh, maintenance and repair is the uh, primary thing with the group that we have today. So um, I would say that's for sure something that Specific Energy can help you with. So with that, um, let me turn this over to Mike and I appreciate it. Thanks for coming and send in those questions as you have them. Thanks so much, Granger. I uh, appreciate everybody being on today, and uh, hopefully you got a chance to watch the little promotional videos that, that we sent around uh, ahead of time for this webinar. And uh, if you were able to watch those, one burning question should be on your mind. What in the world does a crappy old Mustang have to do with centrifugal pumping? Not much, but uh, that is a much younger version of that Mustang with a much younger version of me. I became an engineering consultant 24 years ago and bought this car with my first paycheck. Got her really shined up that day to, uh, to show off the car and show off that little cutie right there who grew up to be that little cutie right there who just had that little cutie about three months ago. And uh, so now I'm a grandpa. But uh, I held on to that Mustang for a very long time under the auspice that I needed to teach my daughters how to drive a stick shift. Well, I got rid of the car a couple of months ago and gave it to my nephew, Elijah, because he wanted to learn how to work on cars. And I said, well, just about everything's broke on this one, so it'll be perfect for you. But it was very different teaching a young man to drive a stick shift as opposed to my daughter's. I had to keep reminding him to quit taking the car above the red line or this 26-year-old Mustang was not going to last much longer. And we all know that about cars. We all understand how dashboards work. And we all know that we're not supposed to take our cars above the red line because one, fuel efficiency plummets, but two, engines don't last very long when you run them above the red line. And unfortunately, we understand this about cars, 
but very few people in the water and wastewater space have been properly trained to understand that every centrifugal pump also has red lines. As a matter of fact, they got two of them, one off the right and one off the left side of this very narrow range that we call the preferred operating range. And if you've heard of best efficiency point, that's what this green line is here. The POR straddles the BEP. And uh, if, if these terms aren't familiar to you, I would love it if you watched the YouTube video that we're gonna send out because I think it'll make a whole lot more uh, sense. But just like your car, bad things happen when you operate above or below these red lines. Premature seal fail failure, premature bearing failure and cavitation tend to happen off the right. Uh, too much vibration, another form of cavitation uh, tend to happen off the left. And all these things are bad for the pumps and that's why Granger and Smith pump pull out so many impellers that look like this it is uh, just unfortunately improper operation. And in most cases, the operators have no idea that this is going on because they don't have the dashboard to be able to tell them. Well, that's part of what we bring. And unfortunately, this is the rule and not the exception. Uh, this is a big pump station in the Houston area it's got four constant speed pumps and two variable frequency drive pumps. And unfortunately, these VFD driven pumps in this case are operated inside the preferred operating zone or preferred operating range just 39% of the time. This is what they were doing before they had our software. And the issue is that they just simply slow these VFDs down too much. What you can't tell is that 15% of the data points are stacked up here at what we would call the shutoff head where the pump is consuming energy and it's producing head, but it's not enough to overcome the static. And uh, so these pumps are deadheaded. You've probably heard that term before. And all of that energy and all that head is just going to destroying these pumps. And even if you do understand uh, what pump curves look like in POR, often people don't think about the fact that it's a moving target. And when you start off with a brand new pump, it's got a characteristic curve that looks like this and a preferred operating range that looks like this. And when it's brand new, you know, the, the guy that's running the pump likely doesn't know much about the hydraulics. He just knows that he's been told to get 1300 gallons a minute out of this pump and he simply slows the pump down until he's getting 1300 gallons a minute, he's still within the preferred operating range and everything's fine. Well, fast forward about 10 years, these pumps tend to wear predictably down and to the left. And so 10 years later, this is what the curve looks like. And the operator likely doesn't know this. He's still getting uh, told that he needs to, to produce 1300 gallons a minute. So he's now running this pump at full speed and he's squarely outside of the preferred operating range, which is just wasting a ton of energy and more importantly, it's wearing this pump out even faster. So the name of our company, Specific Energy, comes from this concept of specific energy, which is just the amount of energy it takes to move a unit volume of water, or the easier way to measure it is just power divided by flow equals specific energy. Now, this was a graphic that I wish someone had taught me 24-ish years ago when I was a consultant. But what we do at Specific Energy is we take all of the components of pumping and model them as our specific energy. So what we would call the useful specific energy, uh, you would call the static head. If you're pumping from a river into a water treatment plant, the distance between those is the static head. We're pumping through a piping network that has friction losses. And so what we call the piping specific energy, you would call friction loss or uh, dynamic losses. There's also losses associated with both the motor and the VFD. But the wild card is the green zone here. This is the pump itself. And they, every centrifugal pump is wildly inefficient off the left side of its curve and it's wildly inefficient off the right side of its curve. It's most efficient at this point that we would call BEP or best efficiency point, which is about 900 gallons a minute for this pump. But if you look, if we can operate this system at the point of minimum specific energy, we can still save a little bit of energy, even if they were operating at 100% of the time at BEP. Now you don't need to remember any of that. What you do need to remember is where this smiley face pattern comes from, because you're gonna see it a lot in the rest of this presentation. Now VFDs are wonderful, but they also cause some issues. Uh, what sent me looking for specific energy almost 12 years ago was a client in uh, near, tennis, uh, near Nashville, Tennessee, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. My client was a good friend of mine and he just kept destroying these new three vertical turbine pumps that he had on VFDs. 
He just kept telling me, Mike, they don't build them like they used to. They don't build them like they used to. And he would point at this 30-year-old vertical turbine that he had had that had never caused any problems. Well, guess what? It was a constant speed pump. And the engineer, long before me, had done a good job of designing it so that when it was on, it was near BEP. And when it was off, it was off. Well, if you have five of those pumps, there's only 32 possible ways that you can run that pump station. But if you put VFDs on those same five pumps and just assume that you can only vary from 60 hertz down to 45 hertz and only at half hertz increments, you just took 32 possible ways to run this pump station and turned it into 28 million possible ways. And unfortunately, of those 28 million ways, 99% of them are bad for at least one of the pumps. Now, if you look really closely, you can see that characteristic uh, parabolic or smiley face pattern here. Now, what we do is we solve all of these simultaneous nonlinear equations in real time and can tell you at any given flow rate, say 3,500 gallons a minute, that the perfect combination of pumps and speeds is pump one at 58.4 and pump five at 55.8. This is going to be at the point of minimum specific energy, which means you're going to save energy expenditure. But more importantly, it's going to be a point where all of the pumps are within their preferred operating range. So these pumps are going to last longer, which is going to lower your total cost of ownership for pumping. At least according to flight, that's 60% of the life cycle cost of pumping is just the power that goes in and the maintenance. So there's a huge opportunity to do good here. Now, the way that we go about doing this is what's called edge analytics. And so we have a small edge device, generally can fit within the same control panel as the PLC. And we gather the data that we need from the PLC. We do most of the heavy lifting here at the edge, but we are also relaying the data up to our cloud servers, which serve as a historian, but they also then create the graphics package that gets relayed down uh, to a web client or to a smartphone. This is what the one looks like in Murfreesboro. It's very small, DIN rail mounted. It's sitting in the same control cabinet as the PLC. There's only three connections, a power connection in the back, a data connection that comes to the PLC, and a coax that comes up to an antenna uh, because we're generally using cellular. I've never gotten to do it, but I've told people that it's so easy even I could install one of these, and uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky is going to let me do that next week so I can finally say I've installed one. Now, we need some data in order to do the things that we do. We need to know what's going on on the suction side of the pumps, either with a uh, suction pressure transducer or with a level transducer. We need a discharge pressure transducer. We need to know flow that can be on suction or discharge. And we need to know per pump power and speed, which normally we can get off of the VFDs through the PLC. If you do have constant speed pumps, we may need you to put in small power meters because we need to know exactly how much power is going to uh, each motor in the system. And that's what we do. Everything that we do at Specific Energy is to help operators operate better, managers manage better, and engineers engineer better systems. We do that by tracking and reacting to changing conditions. The pump curve is constantly changing, the system curve is constantly changing, and by operating these pumps at minimum specific energy and within their POR, we know that we can minimize the life cycle costs associated with pumping. Now, I don't see any questions on the Q&A. If there, uh, I'll go ahead and just go to the demo and I can answer questions later. This is our interface and hopefully Temple Dane is still pumping. This is a pump station in North Texas and uh, it's a five pump setup pumping from a ground storage tank to an elevated storage tank. And I mentioned dashboards. Dashboards are meant to be something that you simply glance at and can tell whether you're in good shape or bad shape. For those of you who were lucky enough to actually drive to work today instead of working from home, hopefully you did not drive looking at your dashboard the whole time because if you do, you crash and you die. There are more important things that operators are supposed to be doing than looking at dashboards. Again, here's our dashboard. Very quickly, you can see that two of the five pumps are operating and both of the pumps are inside their preferred operating range, very, very close to the best efficiency point. The tanks are full, the pressure's steady, water's flowing, everything looks good with this station, as it should, because in this case, this DPO badge here means that the dynamic pump optimizer is in full authority 
over this pump station. It's telling the PLC which combination of VFDs to turn on and at what speed. It's doing that based upon the specific energy map and the constraints that the operators have put in. So in this case, the two that are red here are the ones that are enabled. And what matters to the operators here is that the target tank stays full. And so as the tank gets more empty, it's going to call for more water. As it gets more full, it's gonna call for less water. And in this case, the only other constraint they have enabled is a maximum discharge pressure. They don't wanna go above 77 PSI. There's a number of other constraints that can be configured, minimum and maximum suction pressure, minimum and maximum flows. There's even a power limit that you can put on in here if you're under a curtailment program or something like that and you need to go from 1000 kW to 500 kW. You can simply enable that constraint and the DPO will draw a line and not allow any combination of pumps that would violate that 500 kW. But once all of the constraints are enabled, the DPO automatically draws this box. We call this the sandbox because this is where the DPO is allowed to play. And the DPO's job is to find the point that is at the minimum spot of specific energy with all of the pumps uh, within their preferred operating range that meets this. And so you can see that little green dot moving around there, very, very close to this point right here, which is what it's supposed to be doing. It's doing that based upon the specific energy maps as well. For, uh, forget, forgot to mention this, but uh, these five pumps are identical, but they're not because right now, if I click here, you can see that pump three is the most efficient pump. And if I click here, you can see that pump five is the least efficient pump. These are the combinations of two pumps, three pumps, four pumps, and here's all five pumps operating together. So if the DPO is in control, it's always gonna try and find the spot right here. If you wanted your operators to be in control and you simply wanted to say, I need 4,000 gallons a minute today, you can click here at 4,000 gallons a minute and it will tell you the most efficient combination of pumps to turn on and at what speeds to do that. Uh, so this is how we help operators to operate better. We also have a number of alarms. Uh, all of the tags that we're monitoring can be configured and uh, different alarms can be set up with different severities. And some of these alarms can then be programmed to alarm out to cell phones, either for the operators or maintenance staff or managers. It's all configurable by you uh, to set it up the way that you want. Now, for the managers, a couple different things that we do here. I'm going to bring in a couple of days worth of data. And we're tracking all of the operating points that this pump station has run at. And over time, what you're generating here is the system curve. And again, I'd love for you to listen to, uh, to that hour presentation on basic hydraulics. If you don't understand how system curve and, and pump curves interact, uh, I think that'll be helpful to you. But over time, th these are the system points that this pump is operated at. We also track the current pump curve versus the manufacturer's pump curve. And I'm gonna fast forward here to pump number four because uh, it's in a little bit worse shape. Pump three is in the best shape, overshot there. There's pump four, you can see the difference between the manufacturer's curve and the current tested curve. Well, how do we know that the current tested curve is accurate? Again, these things are always moving. Well, we can click this button right here and if all of the points line up on this current tested curve, that's validation that the curve is still good. If all of a sudden you begin to see the points moving down below the curve, it's time for us to, uh, to update the, the curve associated with it. But this one looks really, really good. We take it a step further because every month there is a report card generated for every station that's on a DPO. You can configure who to have this sent to. So you can have your, your maintenance staff that re receive it. You can have your, your management staff that receive it, engineers, whoever you want, it can be emailed to them. Now it always starts off with whichever repair or replacement it deems most economically advantageous. And I'm gonna come back to that in a second. But this station was operated in full authority mode 100% of the month. And so it's always at peak efficiency. The only time you see pumps operating out of POR is the 2% of the time when they're either starting or stopping. This is an important consideration. This station has lost 5% of its capacity due to the wear and tear. And that's a big deal because you put in a brand new pump station and let's say it's 10 MGD. In this case, this is a nine and a half MGD pump station right now. And that's the kind of thing you need to know, especially during high demand periods is whether you have the capacity that you think you do. 
there's a report card that shows how much water has gone through this station versus the last couple of years, the energy savings, the combination of pumps. And then each pump gets its own individual report card. I'm gonna skip ahead to uh, pump four here because it's the one that it's recommending a repair on. And it's doing that because this uh, particular pump has lost 13% of its efficiency. It's lost almost 11% of its capacity and that's generating a return on investment. The way that it's doing this is that we ask you, our customers, to give us some basic financial information. Your CFO should be able to tell you what the current discount rate is, how long do you think the pump's gonna last, what's your current cost of both uh, demand and consumption charges. And then we ask you to get with someone like Smith Pump and come up with a turnkey proposal for what it's gonna cost to pull the pump out, replace the impeller, replace any seals, bearings, other things like that that need to happen and put the pump back in, a turnkey proposal. Once you do that, the DPO will automatically every month do a virtual repair or replacement. In this case, it says if we were to spend $25,000, we would save almost $67,000 as a net present value of energy, which means you would pocket almost $42,000 and that has a return on investment of 167%. Now, most of you have to report to a board or a council or something like that and watch how fast they stamp approved on a purchase when you tell them that that purchase has a return on investment of 167% because you're now speaking their language. This is another way that we help managers to manage better is give them the tools that they need to make good decisions on when to repair or replace assets. Instead of running them to failure, our hope is that people will begin running them to a positive net present value or to the end of their economic useful life. And instead of wasting a bunch of power on, uh, on wasted energy, you can instead do a capital improvement, plug, plug it into your budget and uh, make wiser asset management decisions. Now for the engineers on the call, I am one, one of my favorite things to do that people like to do. Every uh, piece of data that we're logging can be exported from the system. And so uh, one of my favorite things to do is to come in here and pull the flow and pump head. And I can grab a week, a month, a year's worth of data, whatever I want, export it at whatever resolution I want. And in essence, what I'm gonna do is confirm the system curve that was used in design. And I'm going to show you that here in just a minute as part of the case study and show you how different system curves may be than what your Innovise model or, or your spreadsheet says it should be. But every piece of data can be exported out of here. We actually recommend that our customers give access to the system to their engineers so that they can help with capital improvement planning, situational awareness. They may see something that you don't. And uh, we just believe that more eyes is going to lead to, uh, to better optimization of these pumps. Now, going back to the PowerPoint, I want to show one other thing. Uh, transient control. This is a, a utility in Texas as well that used to be very, very subject to transients. And here's one in April where they had to take us out of DPO control. You can see the amplitude of this is pretty high. Uh, I saw one that went over 250 PSI. They used to have a lot of line breaks in this system before us. Well, this is what it looks like without DPO control. Here's the same pump station with the same x-axis, the same y-axis, and this is what it looks like with DPO control. The amplitude is far smaller. This is, uh, there's still a transient. You can't get away from transients, but you can keep that transient from becoming water hammer that blows lines out of the ground and damages equipment. Now, I believe we had another audience poll at this point, Ian, if you could uh, put that up, it'll give me a chance to... Uh, Cool my vocal cords. How do you know if your pumps are operating as they should? All right, what did we find? No idea flying blind. That's why we called this presentation that. You are not alone. I find that very, very, very few people actually understand where their pumps are operating at any given point in time, what condition they're in, and how could you our industry unfortunately has done a bad job of training people to understand uh, how these pumps are operating and we've done an even worse job of giving the dashboard that you need to, uh, to operate them effectively. So uh, thank you very much for <laughs> being that open and honest. 
I want to give a case study. Here's another utility in Texas that I'm sure most of you know, GBRA, Guadalupe Blanco. This is their raw water pump station number two. When I first came aboard, I've only been on with Specific Energy since May 1st of last year, but when I came aboard, I would go into our dashboard every day and I would check to see who was doing well and who was not doing so well. And when pumps are operated outside of POR, uh, this crosshatch pattern comes up and you can see that uh, four of their five pumps were running and they're all running to the left of, uh, of POR and uh, consuming a lot of energy. So I called Perry one day, our, our president and CEO and founder, said, what's the deal? Why aren't they taking any of our advice? And he said, well, we put this system in about five years ago and they ran it in DPO mode for a while, but then the, the plant manager thought he could do a better job. And so they, they kind of just haven't paid attention to it. I said, really, do you mind if I try to bring them back into the fold? And he said, well, it's kind of what I'm paying you for. And so I took this screenshot and I took this screenshot and I sent it to the email address that I had on file and said, hey, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Mike Bernard. I'm now with Specific Energy. I thought I'd bring something of value to the, to the introduction. And so I thought you'd like to know that if you just turned one of your pumps off and sped the other three pumps up, you'd have much happier pumps and you'd save about 25 to 30% energy. About an hour later, I get a phone call from a guy, some of you may know him, Casey Belote at, uh, at GBRA. And he said, hey, I'm a new treatment plant manager here at San Marcos. And I'd kind of like to know how the hell you know that about my pump station. And so I took him on the same tour that I just took you. And he's like, you telling me that I have access to this. And so I created him an account and uh, he looked at it and said, I want to do it. Let's put it in DPO mode. So we did that. As soon as the DPO was enabled, it turned off pump four because it was the least efficient pump. It sped the other pumps up. It really is that simple. If you're on the left side, you need to speed up. If you're on the right side, you need to slow down, just like your tachometer. And uh, the, the energy savings, you see that these two dots aren't on top of each other. Well, that's just because we were operating off of a five-year-old model and these pumps had experienced more wear and tear. But it's an interesting case study because I can do, this was two weeks after I started, I can tell you definitively that on this day, uh, Casey operated at two different flow set points, basically low and high. And at low flow set point, we were saving him about 36% energy. At high flow set point, it was more like about eight because he was moving closer to BEP. But we can also go back in time and look in 2015 and when they were in DPO mode for the first five months of the year, they were expending about 1,400 kilowatt hours per million gallons for the same first five months of 2020, right up until that day that Casey turned on the DPO, they were spending about 1,900 kilowatt hours per million gallons or a potential energy savings of 25%. Now we've gone back now, we've got a year's worth of uh, operating data or almost a year, uh, it's more like 17.3%, but when you're talking about 700, five 700 horsepower pumps, that's a pretty significant amount of uh, dollar savings. Some of you may remember this, this was a very bad day for GBRA. The camera that's recording this is mounted on the back of that raw water pump station number two. And so the design engineer had designed for a water surface elevation up here. You can see that's where it was for years until the dam failed. They tried to fix it with a port of dam that didn't work apparently and the water level is now far closer to the Johnson screens than it's supposed to. I had always heard that it was possible to crush one of these screens like a beer can through differential pressure, but I'd never seen it until here. You can see that three of their five screens have been crushed and remember screen three, see how far it's sticking up there. That's gonna be important in just a minute. Now, one of the new features that we added last year was this shaft power button. And we did it to give us an indication of something was going wrong with the pump. And in this case, we saw it on this day and uh, Perry and I were talking about it. There were two things that it could have been. It could have been suction side plugging that was causing this dot to be below this line or it's a four stage pump. There was a slight possibility that they had spun off one of the stages from the pump and that's why it wasn't pulling as much power. We called Casey and said, hey, we're pretty sure pump number three is up. Could you go have somebody hit the back pulse button on the, uh, on the screen and let's see what happens. He's like, oh, are you serious? It's like 20 miles away, it's back roads, it's gonna take forever. I said, well, if you don't, you're likely gonna burn up this 700 horsepower pump. 
and uh, so we send somebody out there. As soon as they hit the, the button, this is what it's supposed to look like. The dot comes back onto the line. And now we have proof positive that we are able to predict suction side plugging on these pumps, which is hugely valuable. We also recommended that they put a differential or put a submersible pressure transducer in the can. That would be an even better way to tell if the water level in the can is here and the water level out here is here. You've got a bunch of plugging going on. But we also like to run the hydraulics for these systems and see how they compare the, the real hydraulics to the theoretical. So I know where I'm pumping from. I know where I'm pumping to. I know what I'm pumping through, and I've got the record drawings that shows that there's an intermediate high point in the line that sets that hydraulic grade. So this is what those theoretical hydraulics look like. And based on these hydraulics, this is four pumps running, and uh, the firm capacity of the station should be about 24 and a half MGD. And that's pretty close to what the design engineer said, 25.2. But we've got five years worth of data here. And if we did our hydraulics right, this data should fall right on top of those hydraulics. But they do not. They're not even close. Well, I have to adjust for the wear and tear on the impellers, and that'll back it down a little bit. But you can see that we're still off almost by 250 feet of head, 100 PSI more than there should be. Well, perhaps we're just terrible at hydraulics. There's the original curve by the design engineer. There's our curve. We both saw it pretty much the same way, but the system's not seeing it that way. We initially thought that this was either sediment that had built up in a raw water line, or perhaps uh, there's a filamentous bacteria that sometimes will choke off raw water lines. Maybe that's what it was. Uh, turns out it's air bubbles, and I'll explain in a second how we know that. But what's the economic loss of these air bubbles in the raw water main? Oh, sorry, I forgot about this. Is it a new phenomenon? No, there's a 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Uh, this has been going on for quite a while. We have a, our modeling software will do the economics of things like this. And in this case, it indicates that they're spending about 60% more energy than they would need to if the line was cleaned out, which is 250 grand a year. So we asked him, uh, we noticed there were pigging stations on, on the uh, record drawings. How much would it cost to run a pig through this line? They said, eh, about $10,000. Uh, now that we know it's air bubbles, it's going to cost them a bit more. But just think about if you could spend $10,000 today and by the end of the year, it'd be $250,000. Would you do that? I would. As a matter of fact, I wish I'd have bought Tesla about a year ago because that's about the same <clears throat> return on investment. Excuse me. <coughs> I choked on how much money I could have made if I had done that. <coughs> a bigger deal for uh, this particular pump station is the loss of capacity. One of the nice things in our system, if you come into the specific energy map and you just click on these dots that are associated with the four pump curves, it'll tell you in real time what your firm capacity is. And in this case, it's not 25 MGD. They've lost 28% of the capacity of this station. It's now an 18 MGD station. <clears throat> It was at this point that Casey went, oh my God, Mike, you're my new best friend. I need you to tell my managers this because I keep telling them that we can't get 25 MGD out of this station. And they just keep telling me, well, the engineer said the 25 MGD station. Well, it was when it had new impellers and the line wasn't full of air. It could do that, but it can't now. And you need to know that. And they need to know that. It was almost a very big deal uh, in the peak hot weather time this summer for them. Now, a friend of mine is a utility director here in Tennessee, and I made that comment uh, as we were working with them to put a system in, and he called BS on me in his board meeting and said, you can't really predict the firm capacity in real time. So I pulled up the thing, and it just so happened they were running four pumps at 60 hertz. This is the firm capacity of the station, and you notice that the little dot here is right on top of the little dot here, which is proof positive that we can predict what your firm capacity is at any moment. Now, I was watching one day and I noticed that all of the points on GBRA had moved from about here to about here. And I called Casey and I said, hey, did you guys pig the line? He said, yeah, we did, uh, or at least a portion of the line. I said, that's fantastic. You regained about two MGD with that pigging. Well, unfortunately, I didn't grab a screenshot, but a couple of days later, I noticed all the points moved right back up here. And I called him and said, what? This was before we knew it was air bubbles. I said, what in the world? There's no way you filled that line full of sediment or filaments that fast, what happened? 
And he said, oh no, we accidentally ran pump number three. We just filled that line full of air, didn't we? And I said, yep, well, we now have uh, proof positive that, uh, that it is air binding that's causing this issue for them. And so uh, they're working on that this year. So we're at 37, 12, 37. I got a couple of minutes left. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about how this tool can also be used to help the engineers engineer better. Now, I don't like to pick on engineers unless that engineer is me. And so I'm gonna pick on myself here. This is Murfreesboro Water Resources Department, Stones River Water Treatment Plant, High Service Pumps. Uh, right before I left my previous employer, I get a call from the plant manager, Alan Cranford. He's one of my best friends. He's actually the guy that uh, I was looking for specific energy for a decade ago. And he calls, he says, Mike, I want to go ahead and add the fourth pump to this system. Let's go ahead and just put the same pump in as the other three. I said, well, let's not. And uh, so this is specific energy's modeling tool. I showed it to him. I said, Alan, I'm just going to be open, honest, and transparent with you. I did not do as good a job designing this station as I should have. I said, you know, with one pump running, I'm doing great. I'm right at BEP. But with two pumps running, I'm just barely on the edge of POR. And that doesn't give you much room. You can't even run three pumps and be anywhere near POR. And you have this big gap here which just so happens to be their favorite place to run is right there in the white zone where there's no good solution. It's even a little bit worse than that because you see that, uh, so I asked him, I said, can we put a DPO in on, your, on the station? Let's gather real data to calibrate the hydraulics to and, uh, and see where we run. You can see that uh, a big portion of this data is outside the expected range from the Innovise model higher pressures, lower flows, and it's right in the middle of this dead zone. This is a terrible design by me. You see that there's a big gap here in the specific energy map. You see that all the points for three pumps running together. We can do better than this. And so we use the modeling tool in conjunction with the real data to begin looking for a better pump. It just so happens that uh, Gould's had one, the 24 CLC that fit nicely in here. When we look at it, it gives a little bit better low end. Uh, these red dots here mean that the pump by itself has the propensity to run off the right side of its curve. And so we have to be careful about that. But it fills in the gap here in their favorite area to run. And it gives us the ability to run three pumps in parallel and still be within preferred operating range. So this is better. What we intend to do is as the other pumps fail, we won't replace them in kind. We'll find a better pump like this CLC and we'll go from here to here to here to here. And eventually we'll have all four pumps and you see that there's no gaps here. I can go all the way from 2,500 gallons a minute. If I wanna run all four pumps, I can get as much as 18,000 gallons a minute and I give the DPO some, somewhere to operate. So my specific energy map goes from here to here, and this is what we want to see is this overlap where there's a possibility of finding a solution anywhere along the specific energy map. A much bigger deal as well is that there's a potential energy savings, which is more than going to pay for the installation of the DPO and the design of the, uh, the additional pump. So again, we love to do things like this. We love to train people on how to both design and operate their systems better and uh, help the environment, help you, help operators, help managers, help engineers. That's what we're about here at Specific Energy. And uh, with that, I'll stop and ask if there's any questions. I must have been talking a little faster than I did last time, Granger. <laughs> I finished about three minutes earlier than last time. Uh, great, that's really good, Mike. And I wanted to introduce Perry Steger. You mentioned his name the founder of Specific Energy. He's on the call as well. Uh, but the thing that I didn't hear enough about that I'd like to hear more about is, is what I call the intangibles, um, which are uh, the life of the pump is extended tremendously. And I, I don't know if you have any statistics on that, but we know from being in the pump side of the business that running in the POR will greatly extend the life. Uh, have you guys got any statistics along those lines you could share? I'm going to go ahead and call an audible here and show this graphic, if I could. Uh, hopefully you're seeing my screen here. This is something I've been trying to find the origin of this graphic. It's been 
passed around numerous pumping trade uh, magazines. I'm not sure if you've seen it before or not, Granger. I actually called the guy here that I found it in his article. It turns out he wrote the article and put the graphic in there, but even he didn't know where it came from. But the basically what this graphic is showing is the closer that you can run a pump to best efficiency point, the longer it's going to last. And so MTBF is mean time between failure. And they're saying if you want to get the maximum life out of your pump, run it at best efficiency. And the further you get down here, the lower the life is. So 92% of the life, 53% of the life. And the interesting thing is the Hydraulic Institute states that uh, that preferred operating range is roughly 70% to 120% of BEP, which is pretty close to here. And at least according to this graphic, that's still only going to give you 10% of the potential life of your pumps. Now, why don't we push it to this? Well, it just limits how much you can vary those VFTs and how much flow range that you can get. And we find uh, as I mentioned on, on one of those early slides, very few uh, operations right now are staying even within the preferred operating range. So uh, we're going to help a bunch by getting into here. If people want to, it's very easy in our system to change the constraints to hold to here or to hold to here. It just limits how much variability you can have uh, in that VFD or in that flow rate. Um, I talked to another guy. He basically said that he, he believes that the Hydraulic Institute is not nearly stringent enough with preferred operating range. Is that true? Is that not true? I, I, don't, I don't know, but if any of you know where this graphic came from, I'd love to see the data that produced it. I can tell you several pump manufacturers published this, so it's, uh, it's, it may not be something anybody knows, but I, I believe everyone agrees that this is an accurate representation of life as a function of where you run on the curve. And, and the one story I'd tell, and this is, a, this is a good story because it's about a pump that was sold by Smith Pump 25 years ago. And the pump came into our shop and they said, tear it down and tell us if there's anything that needs to be fixed. And so we asked questions and they said, well, the motor failed, it's 25 years old. We've never had either the motor or the pump out of service we just like to see if we need to replace the bearings or wear rings or something. And we tore that pump down. And this was a pump that was in transfer service operations. So very constant suction head, very constant discharge head. And we absolutely didn't, uh, we didn't have to replace anything. Uh, the bearings were good. The wear ring clearances were still fine. We said, are you sure you've run this? Oh yes, it's got, and then there's hundreds of thousands of hours. So they actually knew that part. And we went out at reinstallation and startup and tested, and this thing is running right at BEP. And yep. that's why it lasted that long. I've got that kind of experience, but I just don't have the statistical parts that, that prove this, but it just makes sense to me. It it's so hard to come up with that statistical evidence because there's so many variables. I mean, we need uh, we need Texas A&M or UT to uh, to run a study on this with only one variable being how far out of POR. Because in the field, it's just hard. But going back to Alan Cranford, he had these VFD pumps. They were uh, I think there were 400 horsepower pumps, and he was having to rebuild them every single year on VFD. Well, he was operating far to the right of uh, of the preferred operating range. He didn't have a dashboard. What happened in his case was he had just taken over managing this plant from, uh, from a guy named Billy. And Billy knew that these pumps were not supposed to be operated all the way up to 60 hertz. The, the preferred operating range is actually 30 to 42 hertz on that pump. And Billy knew that, but Billy didn't tell anybody when he retired. And so that institutional knowledge went with him. There were no safeguards programmed in. There was no dashboard. And Alan had no idea that he was so far out of POR, same thing. That constant speed pump that he had at the other station was running at BEP every time it ran. And once we dialed Allen in, he went from having pumps fail every single year. Uh, that was a, a decade ago. And he's not had a single pump fail in a decade since. So that's the power of running a pump in POR is you can go from yearly failures to who knows how long those things are gonna last now. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, and, and Perry can elaborate, but I mean, his, his company was probably founded more on saving energy. Uh, but I think we all learned that this was 
you know, a way to save or improve life on equipment as well. And it's just kind of been something that has come to light as more and more of these get put out there. Sure. Uh, it's a complex subject. There's, uh, there's a lot to this. And um, if this is a little bit uh, foreign to you, look for our email from Smith Pump. We'll have a link to a, uh, it's about an hour long recording that Mike has done on basic pump hydraulics that really gives a good lead in to this topic. It gives you the basics that you can just kind of relate to all these curves that they're second nature to him, but um, it's, you know, it looks like a new language uh, if you don't look at them every single day. So um, with that, I guess, uh, let's Mike or Perry, you guys have anything else? I think I don't see any questions. So is this a uh, good time to, uh, to adjourn? Perry, you Absolutely. got anything? No, Granger, thanks so much for, for hosting this. This is a, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I uh, am not tired yet of listening to Mike talk about this. So I appreciate it very much. Appreciate the, uh, uh, the, the attendees. And uh, we're, we're passionate uh, about pumps uh, along with Granger and your team. So thank you very much, Granger. Okay, appreciate it. Well, again, look for a follow-up email from us all and give Smith Pump a phone call if, if this is something you'd like to pursue. I appreciate you coming. Have a great day. Thanks, Granger. Take care, everyone. See you.